What's going on, all you cool ghosts and goblins? This is Preston over at Pixelated Paranormal. I just wanted to take a second and thank you for clicking on this video, and we hope you enjoy the show you're about to listen to. There are several ways you can catch up on the podcast. You can catch us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and just about anywhere else you can listen to your favorite podcast. And while you are here, go ahead and click that like button, and don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you can stay up to date on all the spookiness that we have to offer. Remember, stay spooky and stay on the paranormal... Seventh parallel on America's haunted highway, it's Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to episode 123 of Pixelated Paranormal. And on this episode, the gang's all here again. Steven, it's been way too long. Whoop, whoop. I want to say massive congratulations to Pixelated Paranormal's first ever having to edit a photo on our Facebook so we won't get banned for last <laughs> episode true, 122, yeah. where the boys dwelled into the late night alien hour. That picture was fucking hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that picture of David Huggins with his uh, his alien uh, mistress, mistress <laughs> uh, crescent. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think about that, but that was full on uh, chesticles and genitals. Yeah, I got a notification. It was like, oh, Pixel Pro will open uh, upload this. I was like, okay, cool, because I didn't know what you guys were talking about in the last mm-hmm. episode. And I was like, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I was like, uh, yeah, we're probably going to have to edit that. So I just went into Facebook. Hit the old three dots. Did the old Stephen photo, Photoshop special. Draw some black <laughs> bars over the over the parts that Facebook doesn't deem natural. And there you go. There, there you go. There you have it. You know, I think they said something like six states in the U.S. now are allowing women to go topless. So yeah. You know what? Before long, we won't have to edit the. Uh, well, that was bottomless people. too. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So we'll only have to draw one black bar, not two. Yeah, but couldn't you probably claim the fact that that's uh, not a human? It was something else. Yeah, true. And then you have to ask Facebook. So if you're making me censor this, does that mean that you guys are publicly admitting that you believe in aliens? <laughs> Ooh, hoo, hoo. take that, Zuckerberg. Yeah, switch around <laughs> on them. It's good to have you back, man. We're super, super stoked to have you back, and uh, we'll have that new show up and running here before too long as well. Yeah, it's gonna be great. So that'll be that'll be exciting. So thirteen nine anything? What? Oh yeah. Uh, Preston, anything new with you since no. two days ago? <laughs> no. Nice. Same uh, shit, different day. We went and saw Dr. Sleep. I don't know if you guys talked about that. Oh, we didn't. Uh-uh. Like That's a pretty good paranormal movie. <laughs> it was. Hell yeah. Um, uh, why don't we come back after we're done with the main story? Because yeah. I'm sure we'll have time. And cool. let's chat some more about that towards the end. So um, that way it's fair to say if you guys haven't watched Dr. Sleep and you plan to, We'll give you a fair warning, but at the end of the episode, we'll probably have a decent little chat about that. For sure. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I was just thinking to myself, it's been a while since we had the old Spoiler Town, you know, movie discussion, so. Right. Well, I've got one little bit of news here to drop before we get into it, because Preston, you have prepared quite quite a feast for us today, so. Quite the tale. Mm-hmm. Well, this one's short and sweet, so apparently when Hurricane Dorian hit the coast of the U S over in like by North Carolina, it was notoriously known for sweeping a bunch of livestock and animals up into the storm, including 20 some cows in Cedar Island, North Carolina. Well, Well, apparently right where it hit, there was a herd of 20 cows that were roaming in that private area. And they were all supposedly uh, accounted for except for three cows. Well, just a few days ago, (laughs) the trio of cows were found roaming Live and well on a private little island. (laughs) It's awesome. It's just so nuts. It says here on HuffPo, the trio of cows were among those presumed dead until recently when they were all discovered living in the Cape Lookout National Seashore Park on the Outer Banks. 
That's my dog snoring. It's a tremendous story <laughs> of how they <laughs> – it's a tremendous story of how they made it. Park spokesman B.G. Har- Horvat says, If the cows could talk, imagine the story they could tell. It must have been incredible. It seems the castaway cows managed to swim five miles to a barrier island where they survived by grazing off the grass growing through the sand. Park staff noticed the cows about a month after the storm. The others revealed themselves the last two weeks. Now the National Park Service is determining the best way to return those cows and rescue them off of the island and take them back to where they belong. It's like Operation Dumbo Drop, but three cows. <laughs> the picture is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's like it's nuts. just a beach, and then like one little shrub, and they're all hiding underneath <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> like, yeah. They're like, "Fuck this heat, dude! I'm yeah, done." I mean, like, I mean, literally, they could have been discovered in just the right amount of yeah. time because there's not a lot of grass to be eaten. <laughs> Can you imagine? They're like park staff noticed the first cow. You imagine like someone like. Somebody out working, this cow should be like, oh, this is some lost shit. I ain't fucking with this. There's a polar bear <laughs> right. here. I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Like, it's, like just... perfect, it's the perfect movie moment where, like, you walk past that island, you know, 20 times a day for the last three years. And all of a sudden yeah. you walk by and see three cows and you stop and walk backwards. And then the odds <laughs> of these cows living through a fucking hurricane mm-hmm. and then swimming five miles in the ocean. Oh, I know, man. With, I, think I mean, you imagine are... a shark coming across that. He's like, oh, fucking shit. This is the golden corral of fucking shit. <laughs> it's in my, a sirloin stockade. In, of... in, my, in, my, in my realm, this is amazing. And like, this, like that's crazy. Technically, livestock were notorious for drowning. But yeah. the fact these things are able to swim, you know, that's pretty impressive. Could be aliens. <laughs> Could be. But we're just going to drop these here on this island. We'll come back and mutilate yeah. them later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but check this out on this. Uh, I like the end there. Like, uh, but the front runner seems to be sedating them and taking them back to Cedar Island on a boat. You imagine if that boat sunk again and they were like, "Ugh, Jesus. we got to swim yeah, five more miles, sedated." Yeah, it's like What's castaway a cowway, fifteen hundred pounds. Yeah, I mean, give or take, right? We're not farmers; we are scientists. Um, Person, uh, actually, uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, put them on a fucking barge, I guess. <laughs> that's such a cool story we'll just leave them so there weird. yeah there's also another story i was going to get into about a uh a cat at a um fuck what do you what are, what are the places you put okay sorry there's another story i was going to tell you guys about a cat at an animal shelter that was actually quarantined because it was notoriously letting out other animals like he was unlatching <laughs> their doors of their cages awesome. and letting them free <laughs> <laughs> little aristocrat, aristocat. <laughs> right. It's a, yeah, another fucking Disney moment there. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, let's not waste any more time. But like, what, what would the story be? You, you just told the story. <laughs> like, the, Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's it. Like, there's detailed. nothing else. It's like, hey, this cat's fucking dope. Okay. Yep, pretty much. And then probably, you know, about four paragraphs of quotes. Yeah. This is the damnedest thing I never did see. You hear about this in prisons, but never in an animal shelter. Can you do Gary another New York Times? Can you do another interview question with the sound of Herbert? <laughs> <laughs> I got some caps in my pants. Actually, Sean, the the whole rest of the episode, uh, you have to read your parts as uh, Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So good. And, and then the aliens took me upside their <laughs> ship. <laughs> I still have a cold, so I can't quite get it. It's so good. Sport. Oh, my God. I'll never forget the day you fucking surprised me with that. I was like, what the hell? I was going crazy. <laughs> yeah, it does normally sound a little better. I'm still a little uh, little sick, but hell yeah. Well, let's not waste any more time with my you know, all-star impressions. Preston, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and tell us about what you're going to tell us? So I'm excited to do this show. It's a story I came across a while back, and it's got a long, rich background story to the history of the Earth. We have robots. Mm. We have lasers. Mm. We have space travel (gasps) and a plot twist that not even George Lucas could think of. And the book is called Abduction to the Ninth Planet from French author Michel Desmarquet. So Michel starts off by saying one night he awoke suddenly Time felt distorted, and he kind of, you know, was asking these questions in the back of his mind, like, you know, how long have I been asleep? What time is it? And he just was, like, pumped. Like, he just took a hit of cocaine. Like, he's up. He's ready to go. (laughs) 
And he looks over and his wife, you know, she's sleeping peacefully next to him. And he makes his way down to the kitchen and he looks on the clock and it says 12.30 a.m. So this is unusual for him, especially since he had no recollection on when he went to sleep. But the sense of hours had passed. And he had this urge to change his clothes, like this little voice in the back of his mind was like, you know, go put a shirt on, go put pants on. And it's like he was watching himself being driven with no control of what's going on. And then with a fresh shirt and a new pair of trousers, he finds himself writing a note to his wife, who was still peacefully sleeping in the bedroom above. My dear, I'll be away for about 10 days. Absolutely no need to worry. So now... He's walking out the door and outside in the cool air of the night in his home in Australia. Everything is strangely lit, and the, un, uh, the usual song of crickets and critters is strangely absent. He thinks to himself how odd everything looks and how now it is bathed in this strange blue light. He looks down and realizes that, that uh, the bed of garden flowers from his yard is below him, and now he's eerily floating higher and higher above them, and that light bulb moment goes off, and he now realizes that that weird blue light is like a weird tractor beam, and holy shit, what the fuck is going on? Ah, panic sets in, and uh, he's, you know, having an attack. And then he hears this voice. All is well, Michelle. And at this point, he's thinking... I have to be dreaming. This is all a dream. Because before him was a human being of impressive size, like nine foot tall. She, wink, wink, was wearing a one piece suit mm. and com- that was completely transparent. She had a helmet. And he, it's weird because you think that this would be the perfect time to describe what this alien female looks like in the book. But he doesn't. Not till like four chapters <laughs> later. So... I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead for a second and let you guys know that before him was a nine foot tall and a, you know, Swedish blonde, Nordic blonde, just stunning, beautiful babe. Okay. Like a nine foot Pamela Anderson in a space jumpsuit was standing before him. (laughs) Could you say Charlie's their own instead? Okay. I mean, I'm not picky here, Steve, whatever works for you. You sure can't paint a picture. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And Emma Stone for Sean. (laughs) (laughs) hey at least you didn't say drew barrymore yeah yeah there you go so the alien lady says no you are not dreaming and it's like she can read his thoughts because he wasn't you know saying out loud like you know what the fuck is going on he was just thinking this so this you know nine foot tall amazonian blonde is now reading his thoughts And he starts babbling about how, you know, it always happens this way. You know, he's always got this weird dream and, you know, he's trying to convince himself this is all just a dream. But you're speaking to me in French, my native tongue, but we're here in Australia. I do speak English, you know. So do I. It has to be a dream. One of those stupid dreams. If not, though, what are you doing on my property? We're not on your property, but above it. Ah, fuck it. I'll, I'll pinch myself. Ah, damn it. Now are you satisfied, Michelle? But if it's not a dream, then why am I sitting here on this rock? Wait, what the fuck? Who are those people over there? They're dressed in the fashion of last century. So the landscape has changed. He's, he was floating above his house, you know, bathed in this weird blue light. And now he's in this like upside down. So think of like a Stranger Things version of Earth sitting on this rock. And it happened within a blink of an eye. And groups of people can be seen. Revolutionary era soldiers, you know, all eras of people are walking around in this weird gray mist. And Michelle goes on to say, I was beginning to distinguish in the milky light people talking and at a slight distance Others were moving around. And you, who are you? Why aren't you normal sized? But I am normal sized, Michelle. On my planet, we are all this size. But everything in good time, my dear friend. Do you mind me calling you that? If we aren't good friends already, I'm sure we will be soon. Damn right. So at this point, <laughs> things are going good, right? She's all smiles and giggles, and he's feeling this, you know goodness, universal love, hippy-dippy shit flowing from her, and he feels totally at ease. So classic abduction story right now. It's that good old milky light. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Of course you can call me what you wish. 
And what is your name? My name is Dow. But first, I would like you to know once and for all that this is not a dream. Indeed, it is something quite different. For certain reasons, which will be explained to you later, you have been chosen to undertake a journey which very few Earthlings have made, particularly in recent times. We are, you and I, at this moment, in a universe which is parallel to that of Earth. In order to admit you, as well as ourselves, we have made use of an airlock. So, at this point, reading the story, this is how I understood it. Um, to be able to travel in interstellar space and at light speed, these aliens have to use this alternate dimension, and upside down, if you will, to stage and propel their craft to bend time and space. Also, if you're taking someone across time and space and wanted to place them back in a reasonable amount of time so they don't return like a thousand years into the future, you would use this alternate dimension. But the alien gives a more detailed explanation. That's cool. At this instant, time has stopped for you, and you could remain here 20 or 50 of your earthly years, and then return as if you hadn't left. Your physical body would remain absolutely unchanged. But what are those people doing? They exist as well, and can be expected, and as you later learn, their population density is very low. Death only occurs by suicide or accident. Time is suspended. There are men and women, as well as some animals, who are 30,000, 50,000, or even many more Earth years old. But why are they here, and how did they come here? Where were they born? On Earth. They are all here by accident. By accident? What do you mean? It is very simple. You have heard of the Bermuda Triangle. Well, quite simply... Is this spot in less well-known areas, this parallel universe becomes confused with your universe, so that there exists between them a natural warp. People, animals, objects, finding themselves in the immediate vicinity of this warp are literally sucked into it. Thus, you can have, for example, an entire fleet of boats disappear in several seconds. Sometimes a person or persons can pass back into your universe after several hours, several days, or several years. More often, though, they never return. So, dinosaurs, Neanderthals, cavemen, Bigfoots, bipedal species lost to history, yes, Steve, Knights Templars, French and British soldiers from the 1700 era, Civil War soldiers, every fucking thing that's ever walked across this earth who happened to accidentally cross these warp areas are now trapped in this timeless dimension, never aging, never have a thirst, they're never hungry, they never feel pain, and their only escape is suicide or being squashed or eaten by a fucking dinosaur. And then, the body they leave behind never rots. So check this out. The whole thing you described <laughs> this, I was picturing somebody drawing an animation for like YouTube of this section, and then like at the very end, it just got Amelia Earhart, what up? <laughs> 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 like or some shit like that. It's crazy because it's like everything that passes up through here ends up on our side, and he's just like, that's the boat yard, and it's just fucking just hundreds and hundreds of boats. And they're like a mountain of boats. They, yeah, they got like sad faces on it. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my god, just piles of car keys. Left yeah, socks. like just random ass shit. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's like that's like their that's like their hobby there because they all like walk around like like the people in us. They're just drones, you know, like doppelgangers, and then they just like go in there <clears throat> and uh, just look for scrap that that falls through the shit. <laughs> so good. So Dow goes on to say. There was a typical case of this passage into a parallel universe in North America where a young man literally vanished while going to fetch water from a well which was situated several hundred meters from his house. About an hour later, family and friends set out in search for him and there had been a fresh snowfall about 20 centimeters. It should have been quite simple. They had only to follow the footprints left by the young man, but right in the middle of the field, the footprints stopped. There were no trees around, no rocks to jump onto. He simply vanished. So I can't help but think that a large portion of missing 411 yep. uh, cases can't be explained by this. Like hunters and kids, you always hear that in those cases, like they, the trail just goes cold, like you see the footprints and then they just disappear. So maybe, you know, hitting this warp and you know, they're just kind of stuck in this timeless void and, you know, that's where they're all at. So do you, wow. did, did you watch the Fringe? The TV show? 
Uh, yeah. I mean, vaguely. So, like in that in that show, all this weird paranormal shit starts happening, and throughout the case of the show, you figure out that it's like, oh, okay. There's basically the same reality we have, just an alternate reality of it, and that veil has been broken, and so people start vanishing because something happens to the other, that type of thing. Like, so like I I could totally see that type of shit with missing four one because when you started describing before I read down, I was like, oh, that's probably what happened to them. Four one one people. Well, and you always yeah. hear tales, too, of people assuming that Bigfoot is interdimensional, and that would explain a lot, too, if you he can kind of just... Sully think. agrees. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> what if I looked over and there's just this disembodied hand reaching out of the wall <laughs> grabbing my cat? <laughs> oh, my... Like, ah! <laughs> Sorry, Amelia Earhart wanted a cat. <laughs> well, and you know what's funny is I can't remember where they were at, but there was a missing 411... Uh, special that David Politis did for like history or travel channel, one of the two. And I want to say they were at Mount Shasta. I'll find out and I'll update this on the next episode. But there was this story of how like this guy went out with his wife and his kids and they were doing like a nature trail. And he was, I think he was much more in better shape than the rest of his family. And so he went off to do this kind of switchback trail on the other side of this, uh, this gorge so essentially imagine like kind of an open uh, cliff, uh, you know, a cave on the, I'm uh, sorry, uh, a, a cliff on the side of this mountain you could sit on or sit in and then across the little chasm there you could see people walking a nature trail. Well, her husband, this lady's husband went across there to go up the switchback trail and he was never seen again. And it's super creepy because the last photo of this man was taken by another, like a guy and his daughter and his daughter's friend were taking photos, you know, kind of like selfies and stuff like that. And they took a photo and you can see about half of this guy just walking out of the frame of the camera and he disappeared. Nobody ever saw him again. And so they set up this, uh, this laser grid and they shoot this laser from like one side of this cave to the other side of it. And they have these markers and these, you know, sensitive pads and it can measure basically the time it takes from the laser to reach the starting point to this other, you know, sensor. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a poor job of explaining this, but long story short, there was a time disturbance inside of this laser. Like it was shining from one area to another in this cave. That's and both so of these cool. It's, it's crazy. I'll have to, I'll have to rewatch it and, and do a better job of it. That's why I love caves, time. man. Cause I, I always think about like, Caves that are so deep, no one's ever explored. Like, there could be something like that down there, like a fucking portal to hell, or yeah, you know, alternate dimension, well, or you know, or just beings in general. Like, I love that stuff. Yeah, man. love exactly. It. it it was it was super weird. Um, it was super weird because the place they set these two sensors, these, these lasers, were in these two like perfectly round holes that were dug in this cave that were supposed to be used for um like different ceremonies and whatnot from the Indians years ago. And mm -hmm. so they set up the two lasers here in each of these. And they're probably like, I don't know, 10 feet apart. And they said it was really strange because there was a disturbance in the time it took from the laser to reach the sensor from these two holes. And they said it could be some kind of portal. And essentially it was something that they discovered on the filming of that episode that science couldn't quite explain. Like they That's were actually cool. kind of like, holy shit, what did we just discover? The upside down that the aliens use it in a dimensional <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and who knows? The Native Americans could have found it way back when. Yeah, yeah. it could have been. Yeah, exactly. Um, the white man's coming. Let's go through the fucking portal. Don't go through there. Yeah. We need to. <laughs> like, yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to research that again. But I'm pretty sure it's Mount Shasta. But yeah, anyway, I mean, that kind of goes further along with your guys with the story there about having yeah, this, that's cool. this extra dimension. So yeah. Well, anyways, at this point, both her and Michelle are attacked by a group of Neanderthals. Their clubs are raised in the air. Ooga booga. And then, bam! Dal fiddles with this Buck Rogers extra special space belt contraption thing. And these multi-light <laughs> beams shoot out from her belt and hit the caveman in the head. And pew, 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 they fall down dead. <laughs> Did you kill them? I had to. What do you mean you had to? Were we really in danger? I mean, they were people, for God's sakes. Of course we were. These are people who have been here for 10 or 15 thousands of years. Who knows? We don't have time to establish that. And besides, it is of no importance. These people have passed into the universe at a certain time. 
and they have lived in that time ever since. We have freed them from their purgatory. So they bullshit for, you know, a few more minutes about the whole purgatory thing. And, you know, he's like, I can't believe he killed these people. And then this about 100 meters away, uh, they find this like, I don't know, smooth as a baby's ass egg like spaceship. All right. So like uh, Mork and Mindy or whatever that show is that Robert Williams, like Robert. think of that, but like bigger. Wait, back up. Robert Williams. Robert Williams. You is that like a fuck up right now? Apologize. That's a Dollar Tree fucking version of Robert Williams. Yeah. <laughs> I said Robin. You said Robert Williams. No, you said Robert, sir. Get the fuck yeah, out of here. Yeah. Fuck Robert your alien Williams. story. <laughs> Get out of here. Whatever show he was in, it's Mork and Mindy, you uneducated swine. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, Robert Williams. It's like fucking. <laughs> Dollar yeah, Tree that's, version. Man. That's strike one and two, Buck. You better watch it. <laughs> oh. Oh. But he but he brought a Buck Rogers quote, so it saves him a point. Yeah, it saves on, me a point right the there. Nice motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyways, so the egg spacecraft's got this blue light that shimmers, um, and it's like heat wave moving in the air. And so all of a sudden, it's like 10 meters above him. And just like Star Trek, she hits this button on her shoulder, and a light envelops him. And at this moment, she says to him, Do not touch me under any pretext, Michelle. Whatever happens under any pretext, do you understand? And then, bam, they're aboard the spaceship. So the first thing Michelle notices is how bright all the colors are. Like the walls have this intense yellow glow, yet depending on the angle, um, maybe like a blue beyond words, like it's like LSD times 10, like this just intense. And he's given a helmet similar to the one that Dow is wearing, and they make their way to a room that has two coffins, or metal boxes, lying in the middle. Michelle is instructed to lay into one, and he feels a cool mist go over his body. And then in front of him, a screen appears, and it's showing him a view from uh, from outside the spacecraft. First, Earth growing smaller, and then Saturn. At this time... (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At this time, Mich- Michelle is told that they are now traveling several times the speed of light, and he's instructed to rise from the table. And Dow is holding up one blue pill and one red pill and a glass of liquid. And if anybody ever follows the paranormal, you know, there's like this rule of thumb that if they give you food, if they give you the drink, don't drink it, don't eat it. But yeah, he's like, yeah, what if I told you? All of this is <laughs> fucking Morpheus. Yeah. Wait, I've seen this movie before. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen Kung this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the beautiful space alien says, I'm going to give you these two pills, and in three hours, you will be able to consider yourself as pure as one of us. So at this point, she tells uh, Michelle that he's basically like a dirty monkey man, and those <laughs> intense blue and yellow walls and the mist he felt were the first stages of disinfecting method to get rid of all the nasty Earth bacteria and make it safe for him to interact with the space aliens. And this actually kind of reminds me of that story of Enoch, because Enoch was like, you know, the only human ever to go to heaven physically. And when wow. he got up there, like the angels said, like, dude, you can't go for, before God looking like this. And so they had to give him a bath and he smelled really bad. So then they bathed him in the special oil and then they had to shave all the hair off and put him in these white robes and once he was you know clean uh, he was able to go before god and get all the instructions well hey didn't dolly parton write a song about that whole event too called why'd you come in here looking like that (laughs) (laughs) high heel boots and you're painted on jeans all right go back oh jesus go back to what you were saying (laughs) no that's uh that's the next part yours buddy oh shit (laughs) dow took me in her arms put me on the bunk and removed my mask what, is I that, saw that. Is hap- that code? <laughs> yeah, she had like a cat out of the closet. <laughs> yeah. I saw that happen from two or three meters away from my body. I imagine that things in this book seem incomprehensible to the unwarned reader, but I saw my body from a distance, and I was able to move about in the room just by thought. Michelle, I know that you see me and hear me, but I'm not. I'm not able to see you myself. Therefore, I cannot look at you when I speak. Your astral being has left your body. This is no danger in that there's no danger in this. You need to worry. I know that this is the first time this has happened to you, and there are people who panic. I have given you a special drug in order to cleanse your body of all the bacteria that is dangerous to us. I have also given you another drug that has caused your astral being to leave your body. This will last three hours, the time it will take to purify you. In this way, you will be able to visit our spacecraft without danger or contamination to us and without wasting time. So 
so now he's basically like an astral floating around the ship. Um, they're making their way to the ship control room, and he sees this big TV screen, or maybe like that the you know thing on Star Trek that the you know like uh, the big I don't know the big TV screen on Star Trek so right like, at the front of the ship. So talking like about right. the windshield. The what? No, the windshield? Like the, the display that, that like pops up and it's yeah. like, oh, we've got okay. you now. Okay. okay. Uh, so, I'm at- so, so hold on. So basically this astral floating, he's basically like that big gas thing like from Rick and Morty. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to die. Uh, we're just <laughs> trying, trying to, you know, we're trying to make the story rel- relatable to us, Preston, and how we can understand it. <laughs> Yeah, tell me like I'm five. Yeah. Oh. Suddenly, covering a huge area of what I had believed to be a wall of the cabin, I was stupefied to see an image of New York. No, that's Sydney. I said to myself, and yet the bridge was different. Was it even a bridge? My surprise was such that I had to ask Dow, at whose side was I standing? I'd forgotten, however, I was no longer in my physical body, and no one could hear me. I was able to hear Dow and others commenting on what they were seeing, but not understanding their language. It didn't get me far. I was convinced, though, that Dow had not lied to me, and therefore we had we had well and truly left Earth behind. My mentor had explained we were traveling at several times the speed of light, and I had seen Saturn pass by, and later what I took to be planets, suns. So we had come back, and why? Michelle, we are stationed above the planet Arimo X3, which is almost twice the size of planet Earth. As you can see on the screen, quite similar to your world. I can't dis- explain at any length our current mission, as I am required to participate in the operation. But I will do so later. To put you on the right track, I will tell you that our mission concerns atomic radiation, such as you know on Earth. As I watched, I was surprised to see, slightly below the middle of our vessel, a small sphere ejected, like an egg from a hen. Once outside, the sphere accelerated rapidly towards the planet below. As it disappeared from view, another sphere emerged in the same manner, and then a third. I noticed each sphere was being monitored on separate screens by different groups of astronauts. My attention was especially drawn to the darkened place in the entrance of a huge building. I could have sworn something moved. I also felt there was a certain agitation among the astronauts. Abruptly, and with a series of jerks, the thing emerged into the light. I was horrified by what I saw. Apart from some utterances spoken more quickly, and a few exclamations in which emotion could be discerned, I must say they didn't really seem surprised. However, what we were seeing so clearly on the panel was a huge cockroach, about two meters long and 18 centimeters high. 80. 80. Oh, sorry. (laughs) 80 centimeters high. (laughs) 80 centimeters long. Okay. Squish. that bad. (laughs) (laughs) It's a little over two feet tall. That's manageable. (laughs) 80 centimeters high. The giant cockroach made its way towards the probe when a veritable swarm of the creatures emerged, spilling over one another. Just then, a ray of intense blue light beamed from the sphere, swept over the group, and reduced it instantly to carbonized dust. I fucking bam, bam, bam. literally got dusted. Fuck <laughs> out of here. So he goes on to say that each spear was collecting samples from the planet, like air, water, soil. They returned to the ship and they started toward the other side of the planet. Michelle describes the planet as being bathed in a red fog or dust, crumbled buildings, lakes, desert, and then they came upon a settlement of people. We received some excellent shots taken from one of the spheres that hovered above the beach at a height I judged to be about 40 to 60 meters from the ground. Its tube extended right to the shore. Very clearly, it transmitted a scene of a group of human beings. Indeed, at first sight, they were identical to the people found on Earth. We had a very close view. In the middle of the panel appeared a face of a woman of uncertain age. She had brown skin with long black hair that fell to her breasts. I could see on another screen she was quite naked. Only her face appeared to be deformed. She was mongoloid. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm sorry. <laughs> it's such an odd word to use. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> the, best, the best part is like, I'm really getting into this story and I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> 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 oh man, has that? We're really, we're really bridging that fourth wall, aren't we? In this episode, oh, fucking hell. Yeah. okay. So the uh, word, the word mongoloid is that? That's not very PC to use any longer, correct? No, not right. at all. It's basically, he's basically just saying that, like, um, you know, imagine like so, somebody from Mo- Mongolia, like uh, from the Asian steppes or whatever. What? Um, that's not no, what yes. that's no. That's... Mo- Mongoloids don't mean Mongolians. They mean mentally retarded, <laughs> deformed. <laughs> yeah, they mean like severe. Like severe, like deformity of the face, like a pinhead, or oh man, because in the book, like he was totally <laughs> describing her as like looking Paul Tunisian, and like, and then he's like, you know, like a mongoloid from okay, from guys, Mongolia. This is really Preston. bad because we have to decide whether Sean keeps this in or cuts it out because it's his I, fucking goal. Okay, listen, we only keep it in because it's funny. How it's, I I think it's hilarious when someone doesn't know what a word means yes. or thinks it means something else. Like Preston when he's like, I sure can't wait to go to BD's Mongoloid Barbecue and get some of that sweet <laughs> yeah, <like>, stir fry. <laughs> <laughs> like I bet you, whenever I started laughing, Preston's like, "What was so funny?" Because I said breasts. I'm like, "No," because you said mongoloid, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, mongoloid. Okay, so in his reference here, mongoloid would be the right term because he says she was deformed. Yeah. Mongoloid, like Steve said, was just an early, early, early word for people that had severe mental retardation and physical deformities. Yeah. Or like, uh, remember from American Horror Story, uh, the uh, was it season four when they had the pinheads? Yeah, that the they consider them mongoloids. Yeah. I think they even use that term in that season. Possibly, yeah, I they do. Totally yeah. see Michelle Lang's or uh, Jessica Lang's uh, character saying that shit. So, oh, there we go. This is a fun episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it gets right, better. Trust me. Let's get back into it. <laughs> I was going to reread the sentence and I got to mongoloid and started giggling. (laughs) When I saw her, I didn't realize she was deformed. I simply assumed we had to contend with a race of humans only slightly different from our own. As science fiction writers like to describe them, all twisted with big ears and such. Still, we had other shots. And in this group, the men and women seemed to resemble the Polynesian race. It was, however, obvious that more then half of these people were either deformed or eaten away at what appeared to be leprosy. Oh, oh, they were talking about the toxic radiation Mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, Mm -hmm. go right. They were looking towards a sphere and gesticulating, appearing to be greatly agitated. The people on the beach were surging back in masses towards the habitations and dived inside in one big rush while a line of men had formed armed with sabers or picks, facing the most incredible thing I had ever imagined. A group of red ants, each the size of a cow, were rushing from behind the rocks onto the beach. They moved quicker than horses in a gallop. Fucking Ant-Man, dude. (laughs) Wait, so they're fighting giant ants like that movie The The Things? Yeah, and you guessed it. Space lasers. Pew, pew, pew. (laughs) That's crazy. The sphere returned to its earlier position above the beach and produced a special tool with (laughs) which it combed through the carcasses. I could see one of the astronauts seated at her desk talking into her computer. This prompted me to ask Dow if she was supervising the work being carried out. At this moment, yes, for this work was not originally scheduled. We are taking samples of these creatures, pieces of lung in particular, in order to analyze them. We think certain types of radiation have produced this mutant form of creature. In fact, ants do not have lungs, but the only logical explanation for their sudden giantism is... Can you tell me what is happening? Who are these people? It would take too long to explain to you, Michelle, especially now that so much activity in the vessel. But I can satisfy your curiosity by explaining briefly. These people are, in a way, the descendants of certain ancestors of people existing still on your planet. In fact, a group of their ancestors people the continent on the planet Earth about 250,000 of your Earth years. Here, they possessed a civilization which was very advanced, but having raised enormous political barriers between themselves, they destroyed themselves 150 years ago with atoms. Huh. Do you mean a total nuclear war? Yes. 
brought on by chain reaction, we come from time to time to take samples in order to study the degree of radiation still existing in various regions. Sometimes too, just as a few moments ago, we help them. Just then on the panel, we had a shot of a face, apparently that of a female. It was horrible. The poor creature had an enormous gash where her left eye should have been. Her mouth was positioned to the right of her face and appeared to be as a tiny little opening in the middle of her jaw, around which were lips that seemed fused together. On the top of her head, a single tuft of hair hung pitifully. We could now see her breasts, and very pretty they would have been if one didn't have a small wound on the side. With breasts like that, she must have been young? The computer puts her age at 19 years. Radiation? Of course. Other people appeared, some of whom were perfectly normal looking. There were males among them with an athletic build who looked to be doing, who looked to be in their 20s. What is the age of the oldest, do you know? At present, we have no record of anyone older than 38. And a year on this planet is 295 days and 27 hours. Now, if you look at the screen, you can see a close-up of the genital area of that handsome and athletic man. <laughs> As you will know, the genitals are totally anthropy. We've already worked out from previous expeditions that there are very few men actually capable of procreation, and yet there are a great number of children. It's the survival instinct of all races to reproduce as soon as possible. Thus, the obvious solution would be that the males capable of reproduction are studs. This man must be one of them, I think. So, okay. So this <laughs> alien is like, take a look at this. <laughs> take a look at this slideshow I have for you. Zoom in right here. You notice right here that, <laughs> like. <laughs> Ain't that cock a beauty? <laughs> like, which is yeah. crazy because he's like, I can just imagine this, like, dude writing this book. He's like, oh, this guy totally couldn't wait to get to this part. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on. We call his breed of human, or his breed of creature, fire hoses. <laughs> <laughs> we were also able to see many children coming and going around small fires on which food was cooking. The men and women seated around the fireplaces were taking cooked pieces and sharing them with the children. The fire seemed like wood fires, but I couldn't be sure. They were fueled by something shaped rather like stones. Behind the fires, slabs similar to the boat's earlier scene were piled and assembled so as from sh so as to form shelters that looked quite comfortable. In the camera's field of vision, no trees could be seen. Perhaps they didn't exist, because I had noticed green patches earlier as we flew over the continent. From between two huts, some little black pigs appeared, pursued by three furious yellow dogs, only to disappear rapidly behind another hut. I was dumbfounded and couldn't help but wonder if I was really looking down on another, on another planet. These humans look like me, or rather, like Polynesians, and here were dogs and pigs. It was all more and more surprising. The sphere began to return, as did the other spheres, no doubt, that were being monitored by the screens. I could easily see from my position. The operation's return to ship was initiated, and all the spheres reabsorbed without incident as the same before. So now they're back traveling at the, uh, at light speed. The current quest is completed and XP has been earned. <laughs> Dal introduces uh, Michelle to some of the crew. He meets Latoi, Barista, and Naola. They uh, get a long distance phone call and put it on the big screen. And another tall, giant, blonde haired woman addresses Michelle. Hello, Michelle. We wish you safe travel on Theuba. Turning to Dal, I asked what it had all meant. Had we rendezvoused with another spacecraft? And what was this Theaba or Theaula? Theuba, Michelle, is the name we have given to our planet, just like you call yours Earth. Our intergalactical base has been in touch with us, and we will be arriving in Theuba in 16 of your Earth hours and 35 minutes. It then occurred to me that not only this spacecraft, but also the intergalactic base, appeared to be manned by only women. An all-female team such as this would be quite exceptional on Earth. I wondered if Theauba was populated by only women, like space Amazons. I smiled at the image. I have always preferred the company of women rather than men. It was quite a pleasant thought. My question to Dow was direct. 
Are you from a planet solely populated by women? She looked at me with an apparent surprise. Then her face lit up with some amusement. I was a little concerned. Had I said something stupid? She took me by the shoulder and asked that I follow her. We left the control room and immediately entered a smaller room called the Hollis, which had quite a relaxing ambiance. Dow explained that we would not be interrupted in this room since the occupants acquired, by their presence, the right to absolute privacy. She invited me to choose one of the many seats that furnished the room. Michelle, there are no women aboard this spacecraft. Neither are there any men. You were what? Just robots? No, I think you misunderstand. In a word, Michelle, we are hermaphrodites. You know, of course, what a hermaphrodite is. Is your whole planet inhabited only by hermaphrodites? Yes. And yet your face and mannerisms are more feminine than masculine. Indeed, it might appear so, but believe me when I tell you that we are not women, but hermaphrodites. Our race has always been this way. I must confess, this all is very confusing. I'm going to find it difficult to think of you as he rather than the she I have done since I have been among you. You have nothing to imagine, my dear. We are simply what we are. Human beings from another planet, living in a world different from yours. I can understand you would like to define us as one sex or the other, for you think as an earthling and as a Frenchman. Perhaps, for once, you could make use of the neutral gender of English... And think of us as it. A dancing class. But how can reproduction of your race occur? Can a hermaphrodite reproduce? Of course we can. Exactly as you do on Earth. The only difference being that we genuinely control the births. But that is another story. In good time, you will understand. But for now, we should rejoin the others. We returned to the control post, and I found myself looking at these astronauts with a new, <laughs> with new eyes. <laughs> nice. Looking at the chin of one, I found it to be more masculine than it seemed earlier. Another's nose was decidedly masculine, and the hairstyles of some were now manly. It occurred to me that if we really do see people as we think, they are not as they are. Anyways, they're looking at planets fly by on the big view screen. Uh, Michelle has a thousand questions. They see a comet which uh, has a colorful tail which zoom past the screen. Michelle is told that it completes a revolution around its sun, approximately 55 of earth years. And Michelle then asks how far they, you know, how far away um, are they from the object? And Dow responds with four, I don't know, 450 million kilometers. Dow, how is it you use these numerals of Arabic? And when you speak of kilometers, are you translating that for me, or do you actually use this measurement? Explain it to me like I'm five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we count in Kato, or Takai. We use the numerals that you recognize as Arabic for the simple reason that it is our own system, one which we took to Earth. What? Okay, explain further. Michelle, we have several hours before arriving on Theuba. This is probably the best time to start educating you seriously on certain matters. If you don't mind, we'll go back to the house where we were before. Hell yeah. And that's it, folks. That's where we're going to learn about the true history of the Earth. And I think that's a good place to put a pin in it. As, uh, you know, the next part's the real history of Earth and uh, the invasion of chicks with dicks. (laughs) Wow. That part (laughs) is more offensive than mongoloids, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, that was good. Good job. Yeah, presto. I'm I'm actually pretty impressed by that. Dude. I really I really like when you do these things with the the interview things. I like that. It's fun. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. Good well, job. Uh, the next one that I put together, Steve, I can uh, interject, uh, just erase Sean's name and put your name in there, and we'll let you be the Frenchman. Ooh, that's cool, wee man. Wee. <laughs> hell yeah! And then the good news for listeners: part two will be the very next episode. It's already done. <laughs> it's already ready to yeah. record. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. Well, Presto, I uh, I I really like what you did there, man. That's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Good job. Cool. Thank you. Well, um, Steve, do you uh, do you want to share a creepy pasta story, or do you yeah, guys want to yeah. talk about? You guys want me um, to? Yeah, man, do it. Go oh ahead. yeah. Kind of short. 
change of pace. It's been a while since you've been on, yeah. man, so I think it's good to get cool. back to uh, your <clears throat> segment. So this is on the uh, subreddit Paranormal Encounters by user Sean Strike. What? He said he writes, I'm just looking for answers. So a while ago, I was in bed and I randomly woke up. I don't know what time it was, but I think it was like 320 or 323 or something like that. I recall the repetition of numbers. And I looked out the window into the darkness of the night and saw that it seems to be a figure, which was more of a silhouette, really. I kind of disregarded it as I thought it was my sleepy self trying to interp- interpret the darkness. Fast forward to today... This morning I saw a square-shaped silhouette in my bathtub before I turned on the light on. I disregarded it again as I thought it was once again my drowsy self making up shapes in the dark. Later on in the day, the random figure in the dark that I mentioned in the previous paragraph popped into my thoughts and my body shook and tears welled up. Can can anybody tell me what just happened? I never experienced such a thing and I've thought about the figure outside my window before. What do you think about this? What the fuck, man? What do, you, what do you guys think? Uh, I don't even know what to think, man. Um, does it say where that took place or anything else in the comments down below? Mm-hmm. No, this person says, could it just been your reflection? Children often don't know how to calibrate things in their mind at a young age. As for you feeling distressed at the thought of it, I have no clue. Could have been my reflection. The window was on. Would the window was on an insect screen, not closed. God. So <clears throat> the the actual reflective portion of the window was covered by an insect screen yeah so yeah he probably saw a ghost a little ghosty so he said and then this person says some serious questions you mentioned if you've ever experienced anything like this before has anything happened to you since this posting do you live in an older house currently experiencing any intense life stress anyone else at home experiencing high stress did you get any vibes during the experience of sadness anger general negative uh, juju or conversely anything anything positive feeling and he writes back, I live in a 30-year-old house, only we have lived in it, and I've been experiencing, and just been experiencing this now. As of life stress, I'd, I'd only say university as I'm 21, so not much going on in life, and no one at home is overly stressed. The vibes I get are mostly fear and the sensation of pins and needles all over me. Even as I type about it now, I have that sensation, just not as powerful as it was the time of the post. And that's it. Oh, man. That was 14 oh, days ago. No update, boys. No update, boys. Has he made any other posts? He's now in that alternate. <laughs> he's now in that alternate uh, reality with the hermaphrodites. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I I need to go to Reddit more because there are some pretty good uh, yeah stories there, man. Yeah. I don't ever think about it. Pretty fun. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we're right at an hour. Should we go into the doctor's sleep? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Oh, man. You guys want to? Good on time. Cool. Cool. I mean, listen, we should probably give them an extra something because we really, like, screwed them out of content for, like, the last two episodes. Oh, says you. I brought the heat. You're the one that wanted to bring some goober fucking paint in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I brought alien sex, the the fanny ghost of Cock Lane. And visual aid. <laughs> hmm Yeah, and the visual <laughs> aids, yeah. No, you might as well, man. Okay. <laughs> All right, now hang on a second, guys. I decided to go ahead and put this uh, little chat we have about Dr. Sleep after our credits because, again, it's such a fun movie, and if you have any plans to watch it, gosh, we don't want to be the ones to spoil that for you. So if you have not seen Dr. Sleep, finish the episode, and then uh, don't continue listening after the credits. And if you have seen Dr. Sleep or you just don't really care – then uh, after the episode is over, we'll come back and have a little bit of a spoiler town. But again, guys, the three of us are all huge movie nerds. Please, if you don't want Dr. Sleep spoiled, go ahead, finish the episode, and then turn it off as our credits start to roll. <laughs> well, should we plug some stuff and get out of here? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, check out Mark's solo show, Pixelated Sausage. Check out his Attack the Backlog. Take a look at our Patreon. If you guys would like right now, we have just a uh, just a dollar donation spot there. If you guys want to throw a buck at us, that would be great. If not, we still love you. And if you uh, do, we'll, it, we'll, every, every episode we'll give you a shout-out. Patreon Yeah, shout out, yeah. For sure. Most definitely. And uh, we're looking at um, an interesting... Um, tier for patreon for 13 nightmares it'll be pretty neat and uh, i don't think we'll upset anybody it'll be kind of a, a, a unique 
type of reward to get from that. So we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, 13 Nightmares should be dropping. What do you think, Steve? You think we'll have it dropped in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Yeah, after after the holidays over, there was just too much of a time crunch to get that uh, produced and ready to go before Thanksgiving. So, but I think you're going to like what we got. So, cool. And uh, Presto, what do you got for us? Well, as always, if you need a beard, if you want a beard, if you want to grow a beard that will make you the top alien stud for fucking on another planet, <laughs> check out BigDobsBeardBomb.com and use promo code PXLPARA for 20% off your order for those sexy scents like Dundee Cedar, Sweet Tobacco, Bay Rum, Classic, Fresh Citrus, Mint, Woo! Big Dobbs is where it's at. Can you get on Facebook on his page, like his business page, and leave a review with that? Do you want to? Do you? Do you want to be the sexy stud and pregnant women on an alternate planet? You I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe run it by him first. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, hell oh, yeah. That's fucking funny. And also, guys, check out uh, check out Gunslinger Soap as well, gunslingersoap.com. And then go check out if you're in the Wichita area or you find yourself passing through, go say hi to Leslie and the rest of our friends up at CD Trade Post on Pawnee and Seneca. Heck yeah, great place. Yeah, use DVDs. Blu-rays, brand new pop vinyls, and kick-ass t-shirts. Mm-hmm. You can get it all there. Hell yeah. Cool. Indeed. All right. Anybody got anything else we need to drop? Yeah. Check out our Facebook at Pixelated Paranormal Podcast. Join that stuff. Check out our Instagram. It's always popping over there. PXL Paranormal. Oh, yeah. Just don't report our pictures because sometimes Sean, you know, <laughs> puts some alien snatch up on I there. mean, it happened one time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happened one time. Uh, As an artist, I don't believe in censorship. So take right, that, right. society. Heck yeah. And hopefully everybody has a good holiday. Yeah. And yeah. Um, another recommendation I don't want to get into any plots or anything like that because I think everybody should go into this movie. <laughs> With a clean view, not expecting what they're going to expect, and that's Midsummer. Go watch that shit. <laughs> yeah, fucking loved yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was something. something. <laughs> yup, yup, yep. And <laughs> light. I mean, something. in the same vein, go check out Lighthouse if you haven't a chance. Lighthouse is very, oh, I want to see very akin <laughs> to uh, Midsummer and Hereditary in a way. So, Hell fuck. Yeah. And and I wish Preston, I wish you'd seen this already, Joker. We won't say anything oh, about yeah. it, but man, Incredible. Joker was a phenomenal movie. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. boy. Oh boy. Cool. All Thank right. You. Well, guys, I think that just about does it if we don't have anything else to drop. All right. Well, I'd like to sign off by saying cheers to the weird shit in this world and those of us that love to talk about it. And stay spooky and stay on the paranormal highway. The cast that pixelated paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the paranormal highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. Email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal your guide to the unusual and the strange. Go ahead and turn the episode off now. Uh, if you have, go ahead and keep running. Or if you doesn't really care, that's fine too. But I'm sure we're going to drop a couple spoilers about Dr. Sleep. So uh, fair warning, if you haven't watched it, now's the time to get on up out of here. Get on, get on up. up. Get on up. <laughs> get on up. All right. Here. So who uh, who wants to start, man? Every, all three of us saw it. Would uh, everybody like it? Oh yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Me too, man. Fuck yeah, I dude! I love that movie. It's it's. I don't know, man. Like I, right now, it's in a weird spot because I think that they did release it at a bad time. They sure did. You know, this is a spooky yeah. movie. You know, not really like hardcore. Um, scary i don't think it's more of like a intense thing but like it just has so many things going going for it mm-hmm. um but unfortunately because it wasn't released in october so released in november and people were kind of unsure what it was because like if you 
when you look at the trailers, because some of the trailers for it were kind of bad because it never really directly told you that it's a sequel to The Shining. Right. They kind of hinted at it, and you're expecting more from random viewers. Right, you know? right. Because if you're not Especially. really like, you might know what The Shine is. Like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Well, okay, whatever. But then it's like, oh, really? A, a sequel? What? Mm-hmm. Like, and then you can kind of get like get the, the thing, but they never really let that be known. So unfortunately, the box office numbers were really shit on it. Um, but every everybody I've talked to loves it, except for a couple people. But it yeah. just what so didn't they like about it? Uh, some people don't like the that you know when you actually go into the movie, you start seeing direct references to The Shining. You know, they go back to the Overlook. They you talk they talk to Jack that's kind of like a, a younger supposed to look like Jack Nicholson. Um, Which is actually, that's Elliot from yeah. uh, E.T. Yeah. From oh, ET, that's yeah. who played uh, Jack, huh? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay. So, I knew he was in the movie. I just didn't know what part he played. Right. And then, um, and then, you know, they show like the blood coming through the hallway, the mm-hmm. twins, the bitch in the, um, sorry, you can cut that out. Uh, then the old naked woman, you know, that's in the bathtub, you know, all these, it's too on the nose for some people, you know, like, yeah. but I thought it fit the, I thought it fit the plot when they have to go back there. He has to end it. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And like, you know, I did, I haven't read the book. I don't think Sean has a uh, listener. Chauncey does has, and he really, really enjoyed the movie. And he's like, yeah, there's some things they did different in the book, but you know, it's great and great fucking movie. So uh, I uh, read an article from the director, and the, so the director and writer he did uh, the House on a Haunting uh, Hill, um, Haunting of Hill House. Yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> he butchered the fuck did, out of it. <laughs> yeah, he did that. He also did uh, Gerald's Game um, on uh, Netflix as well. Yeah. Did, oh, did, did you guys uh, watch is, that? Yes, I did. I have not watched it. I want to. Yeah, he uh, he uh, the the guy that you know ET. Uh, he plays the dad in the uh, the Hill House uh, show, and then he also plays the dad in the Gerald's Game. Um, so that's kind of cool. And that, that, that director, pretty cool because according to Sean's wife, I got the details the other day when I went and got my haircut. She said she's gonna get um, her and Brandy are gonna get the whole ET cast when we go to Frightmare. That's what I said. I was like, I told her. She's like, I don't care. She's like, I, I'd love to do that. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, you are only going to be in. Before then and get it autographed. So that'd be everybody I mean, but Drew Barrymore, right? Yeah, Fuck. it's it's the older brother, uh, Elliot, and then the, the the woman that played the mom. So and and from what I hear, from what I've seen from other pictures, from other cons, they bring props like they have this like fucking E.T. and like a hoodie and, and all the types of stuff like that. So, uh, OK. Oh, yeah. But anyways. So uh, in that uh, so in that article, he talked about how, um, you, you know, Stephen King and a lot of people were really pissed about The Shining because Kubrick had really changed a lot of the plot points and changed, um, you know, Jack Torrance's kind of story arc of somebody who has a mental breakdown but then has redemption at the end mm-hmm. to Jack Torrance who's already kind of physically abusive and looks like he's about to mentally snap and um so a lot of the original book um was not in that movie so the the writer and director of Doctor Sleep said you know I kind of wanted to go back and retrocon that and so fix some things and so he kind of blended parts of the original shining um, that were not there with parts of Doctor Sleep to kind of not only pay homage to the book, but also to tie it into, you know, Stanley Kubrick's universe, so to speak. Oh. So he was kind of doing two things at once. Mm-hmm. And so when people are like, oh, well, that wasn't in the book. Or, oh, well, you know, it, most of that shit never is in the book. But the fact that he was trying to kind of meld two universes together, um, I thought was really interesting. And I really appreciated that as a viewer. Yeah. And he said in the. Chauncey said in the book that like they really key in on and uh, the shining, they really key in on um, the generators, whatever that caught fire yeah. and blew up. 
but in the movie they never do. So when right. he went down there, <laughs> when oh, Danny went well, he down there, we like, some of the inequities, huh? Yeah, like so. I think that shit's cool, you know. Like I don't. Yeah. My thing is, man, with this when this before this movie came out, we've got you know we've got some people locally that get to go to stuff early and stuff, and they were like kind of painting it and. And I didn't care because I'm going to watch it anyway. But, like, the whole time, like, it, I watched it. I was like, okay, let, I know this is going to be good. And it, and it turned out to be fucking great. Like, mm-hmm. I just it's so weird to me. And Ewan McGregor is just a fucking phenomenal actor. I love everything that dude's in. Yeah, he does good. I think the problem that people have with a movie like this is that 40 years later, it's really – it's really hard to make it successful without referencing, you know, a lot of the stuff that happened in your first movie without that mm-hmm. fanfare. So then a lot of times your directors turn around and just make it just ridiculously over the top, like, see what I did there, see what I did there. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that's part of the problem is sometimes we see just a little bit of that and maybe it just sullies the entire thing because you're like, I don't need all this shit. I know exactly what's going on. But you know, for me, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed him riding his little tricycle. You know, they kind of reenact the last few minutes of the movie uh, in the beginning of Dr. Sleep. And then, of course, they go right back to it. And I think it's important. It's also important to show that those those spirits are still there. You know, it'd be kind of annoying if they don't show those blow-for-blow blow scenes again. And all of a sudden, like, the bathtub ladies show up and the twins show up. And you're like, oh, they're all just here, huh? Like, it was yeah. nice to see that reenactment. Did they have the did they have the the man with that dude in the dog costume in there? Um, I didn't see him. I don't remember. But right I was watching a I mean, it's, thing today about um, Watch Mojo. <clears throat> it was, like, the top most paused moments in horror movies or whatever. And that was on there with the dog mm-hmm. and the man in the shining and i was like they they were like yeah this is paused because people are trying to figure out what it is or whatever and then some people say that um it's just like some weird just random stanley kubrick thing to do but then some people say that it's because um because that jack was abusive and like just an asshole and like just a rude dude beforehand before he went to the overlook hotel and that he possibly did abuse either an animal or Andy was walking up there and she saw that that was maybe like her conscious and like the, the entity taking doing that to mess with her and then be like, mm-hmm. well, you know, like something like that. Who knows if either one of them things are true, but I thought it was really, really interesting. Hmm. But I don't know. I love, I love that movie, man. I, I want to, I want to see it again. It's a longer movie. Um, it's just cool. I like the whole like gypsy lifestyle type <laughs> yeah, people, yeah. like villains that go around stealing people's shine, and like that's just that's just cool to me. Like it's, it I don't know. It's without being an X Men movie, you know <laughs> the elements, yeah. Because you had all of them, each one of them shine was a little bit different, and I kind of like that too. Because I'm like, oh great, it's just a bunch of people that uh, can run around and see the future, and that's going to be exciting. And then no, they and I don't know if they different... if they I don't know if they actually hinted it very well, but in the book, um, the so in the movie she calls um, Ian McGregor's character like Uncle Dan, uh-huh. but that's because in the actual book her mother was uh, Jack Torrance's daughter from another marriage. Whoa. Um. And so in the book, that is his actual niece. Like, they are actually related. That's why she has the shine, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and that's why she's able to communicate with him. Oh, wow. I actually like the fact that they did not make that direct reference, because that, to me, yeah. is just like, oh, of course. Of course you're related. And, uh, you know, I, I like the idea of just calling him uncle because he's an older guy that still wants to be her friend, you know? Yeah. I mean, everybody does. I mean, like my Brady's kids call me Uncle Steve, right? Shit like that. Like that's awesome, man. Yeah, I don't know. I really like the movie. I strongly suggest you see it. I mean, it's perfectly fine to wait for DVD or digital, whatever. Sure, yeah. Like it's it was it's just a visually pleasing movie, especially towards the end. And the way the story was written, like it really disappointed me that it has become a box office flop because I I think so many people are missing out on this experience. Like it's just a really solid movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. So check this out. 
I'm a massive Pennywise fan, massive It fan of both chapters. It chapter one was really, really good. But as a paranormal horror movie, Dr. Sleep is the best Stephen King ad- new adaptation of the newer round of movies compared to the 80s, 90s. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm dead serious. Like as far as like movie, like I'm thinking of like, you know, that pet cemetery wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. It's been great. But what else has he had lately? The Gerald's game, 1922, all them type of things. Yeah, 22. They kind of, they hit that, uh, into the tall grass was really good though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying like, I think that out of all them, like Dr. Sleep is, is great, man. Like mm-hmm. it, it's definitely my favorite. Well, they did a great job with it because, uh, what's her name? Rose the hat. Mm-hmm. She, you're like, well, she's kind of a weak final boss, so to speak. You know, if like if she's the monster at the end of the tunnel, it's kind of lame. So I really like the fact that, you know, they, they handle her powers pretty neat. They show you her, you know, her amping up by right? sucking in a bunch of the souls and the shine. But I do like how that little girl was just a fucking badass all on her own. Yeah. Where she like, like tricked when, them. Into yeah, the hallucinate or fucking sure. ripped her hand apart. Yeah, yeah. That shit was and then awesome. just that whole scene in the forest was wonderful, and it was just I don't know. It was a movie where like I wasn't at, on the edge of my seat the entire time, but I was engrossed the entire time. Like there were there were several moments where I'm just like, oh god, like I, what's gonna happen? Please, I just I hope they make it out of this alive, you know. And then the little the little boy at the grain silo or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, that part was pretty heart, you know, wrenching and, uh, they just did a really, it's just a really good job. Solid movie. You watch it and it's like what, almost three hour movie, two and a half hours. Yeah. yeah but I long. wasn't at, at any moment was I sitting there thinking like, just fucking get it over. Yeah. That's you the know? same way I felt too. And I mean, towards the very end, you know, as the thing whole kind of crescendos together, I'm like, oh man, like a little bit longer. <laughs> Mom, can I please stay out just for 30 more minutes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it was cool, man. They did a really good job with it. They referenced a lot of, you know, great parts. I liked it. Heck yeah. Yep. Well, yeah.
more highway.